Well, this is Stacey Barr here, Performance Measure Specialist of StaceyBarr.com. Most of my work in performance measurement is about measuring results, uh, the things we want to achieve um, or improve or even excel at. And because of how many organisations still struggle with that, um, that keeps me plenty busy. Um, but I started my career as a research statistician and mostly then I was using data to explore and diagnose problems. And I know that measuring results is definitely not the only thing we should do with data. Uh, so my guest today is a friend and colleague, Mike Davidge. I found Mike accidentally on the internet uh, in a great YouTube video that he created for his organisation, which is NHS Elect in the UK. He's a director there. They provide training and support to uh, NHS, the National Health Service. And Mike's focus is on data for improvement. And if you went to Google and you search for the terms Mike Davidge measurement, you will find it easily. But I will post a link to the video um, in the, the show notes. Mike's philosophy of measurement is really closely aligned with mine and I think both of us were, were really happy to discover that. Um, so really it's a no-brainer that I should introduce you to him. Like I mentioned, um, I keep busy enough with measurement of results and I don't have time um, for other uses of measurement. So it's, it's just such a thrill to have someone like Mike to collaborate with uh, on this topic of measurement for diagnosis. So welcome, Mike. Thanks very much, Stacey, and uh, it was a delight for me too to uh, meet with you. Um, who says internet dating is uh, is a bit passe? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've thought for a long time, working as I do in the improvement side of measurement, so using data to help understand whether we've actually made things better, um, that we could apply the same techniques to performance measurement, as we call it here in the UK. Uh, and certainly the NHS doesn't use your approach to performance measurement. And I think it, it should because improvement and performance are really two sides of the same coin when you're talking about measurement. Uh, and so it's great to uh, collaborate with you uh, on this topic. Uh, excellent. <laughs> so, uh, if um, if my listeners have been listening to me and, and reading me for a while, they'll they'll have a pretty good idea of what the measurement of results is or performance measurement. And we call that uh, call it the same thing over here, Mike. Um, what can you tell us though about you know what measurement for diagnosis is all about? Yes, okay, so measurement for diagnosis, and I'm going to use uh, the healthcare context for this because that's where I work. Uh, apologies for those of you who don't work in healthcare, but I'm sure you can make the connection to your own industry. We start with a, a problem, a, a symptom. Uh, for example, patients are waiting, um, the, the blood test results are late yet again, or we've lost them. Um, so we start with a symptom, and if we do what we normally do in the NHS, which is just firefight, we just go and treat the symptoms. We just go and sort out that patient who's waiting, or we just go and find the blood tests or we'll repeat them. And if we do that, we simply go around in the same loop. The other problem is that people have a pet solution. They say, oh, I know what the problem is. Yeah, patients are waiting. Well, that's because we need more staff. <laughs> so, Measurement for diagnosis is really about stopping and pausing and saying, actually, let's just go and find out what's really causing the problem. So you're now trying to look for the root cause. So yes, patients are waiting, but what's causing them to wait? It could be that we don't have enough staff, but there could be lots of other things that are contributing to that. For example, the way we set the appointment system up, the fact that we have enough staff in total, but just they're just not on duty at the right time so on and so on. So measurement for diagnosis is a way into understanding the root cause. The, the root, root cause analysis is such a, um, an important thing, I think, for us to do in, um, in, in the whole field of organisational performance, really, um, because really what we're trying to do there, I guess, is, is find the easiest or cheapest way 
to a solution that has the highest leverage, uh, a solution that um, we once we've found it and we we can set it and forget it. Basically, we, we, we're going to um, get to the root of the problem, fix the root of the problem, and the problem doesn't have to repeat. And we don't go around in the same loop like you said before. So this is cause analysis in a sense, Mike. Um, what what are your favourite tools for for cause analysis in, in that context of measurement for diagnosis? So my favourite tools are really very very simple. Um, I teach uh, measurement for improvement to a whole range of, of people um, and interestingly most of them when you ask them the question did you like maths at school the answer is no so I'm mm. starting um, it's a bit of an uphill battle to some mm. extent um, so I keep things simple and I'm not alone there because the the, the seven quality tools as they're called uh, first that phrase was first coined by a, a Japanese guy called Ishikawa way back in the 1950s and 60s um, are really straightforward simple things and, and that's because he said actually using these will help you solve 95 percent of your problems and that for me is is good enough so that what are they well there are a couple that are to do with with actually words data, if you like. So there's a flow chart, or we call it a process map, mm -hmm. understanding the actual sequence of the process. And then there's the fishbone diagram, which is sometimes called the Ishikawa diagram after his name, which is a way of trying to unpick root causes uh, around a series of common factors like uh, people, like uh, materials, environment, processes. So that's a couple of, of qualitative tools almost to try to understand what, where the problem might be. Then we're looking at the quantitative side. So there are very, starting with the very simplest, which is the tally sheet or the five bar gate as we call it. So just keeping a track of what occurs over, over a short period of time. And then converting that into... Um, a special bar chart called the Pareto chart, which was mm -hmm. first, and that link to uh, Pareto was made by Joseph Jaram, another one of our improvement gurus from the 20th century. Um, there is uh, a histogram, or the frequency plot. Uh, there's a scatter plot, the XY plot, sometimes it's referred to in Excel. And finally, your your favorite chart and mine, Stacey, the control <laughs> chart. Yes, indeed. So that's a way in, but there's also a couple of others. If you're thinking specifically now about what I call geography, about where specifically is the problem. And then there's a couple of things you can do. One is called uh, the measles chart, and that's a, a great chart if you've got events that are happening and you want to plot on a map. It could be a floor plan, it could be a layout, exactly where those events are happening. And perhaps the most famous of those, and uh, you can Google this, is John Snow, who was a doctor operating in London in the mid-19th century, and he plotted cholera deaths on... Uh, a street map of London and discovered that the, 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 the potential source of that was a contaminated water pump in the middle of a, a place called Broad Street and when they disabled the pump then the death rate dropped. So that was a, a fantastic, a classic example, I say you can Google that. Another one is called the spaghetti chart because what you're now doing is simply uh, on a floor plan drawing a line which follows the movement of a, a member of staff as they complete a regular task or the movement of patient maybe or a customer in an area to see whether there's any repeated movements um, and patterns that might occur from that. And then the final tool is a very very simple one and anybody who's got young children will recognize this it's called five whys <laughs> and you you simply ask why did that occur, but you don't stop at the first. You say, okay, well, why did that happen? And what you're trying to do is dig down a little bit deeper to get at what is the system weakness that's generating that symptom that you see day in, day out. Uh, Mike, was five whys invented by children, or was that something that Peter Senge talked about? I can't remember where I first learned about five whys. 
No, I don't know either, actually. It's a, it's a standard tool that uh, organizations that use lean thinking apply. But I, I'm guessing it may have um, had its, maybe an influence at least, from those uh, that persistent child who won't stop asking, why, why, why? <laughs> It's great. I love it. I love Five Wise. It's really cool. So thank you, Mike. You've listed a, a bunch of tools um, for um, for starting that that investigation into where the causes might be. Uh, I do notice that you didn't mention brainstorming as one of those tools. Quite thankfully, I think brainstorming gets overused in context it doesn't belong. And the, the the Ishikawa tools that you spoke about, and the um the 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 where is the problem type tools, and the the Five Wise have a bit more deliberate intention about them and a better structure for really getting to, to root cause. Is, it, is that a fair thing to say? Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, brainstorming is really about ideas generation. And my experience, at least in the health service here in the UK, is that people don't need any encouragement to generate ideas about why, why the problem occurred or what the, the reason is. Uh, what we do need is evidence to back up our hunches. And those, so that's why the tools that I've listed are so useful, because they are providing that evidence that our bright idea about what's caused the problem actually has something to back it up. Mm, cool. Exactly. Evidence. I love it. Um, so you, you've shared these tools, but we don't just... Um, just gra grab a group of people, sit together and start doing um, a, a Pareto chart or, or um, a floor plan or a measles chart. Um, and we certainly don't start attacking each other with five whys. There's got to be some kind of meta process for how we approach measurement for diagnosis. So if there is, what would it be like? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Uh, so the way I look at it is this. Um, we have to start, really, with a theory, an idea. So in, the, in that sense, we are starting with our pet theory about causing this. But instead of simply going straight to a solution on that pet theory, we, first of all, have to get evidence that actually our theory about what's causing that patient waiting is actually the real situation. So that's why we're sifting through the data to try and find some evidence or for our position or actually to say no actually there doesn't seem to be anything in the data that suggests that you were right when you said this is the cause of that of the, of the patient's waiting and so therefore we we sift through it and what we tend therefore to do is is look at quite a lot of data and look at it in different ways the various tools I've listed are just different ways of looking at the data that we have and we just essentially throw away what isn't helpful or, or say actually that's not telling us anything right okay fine and we're not judging it in that so we're simply saying it's not helpful it's not leading us where we need to go so we'll just move on and look look at something else so we are testing out our theories using the data to see whether there is anything in there and so if I have a warning at all it's that you have to start first with that theory, with your idea about what's causing the problem, <clears throat> and then you go to analysis. You must have your theory first. Otherwise, you can just do analysis after analysis for the sake of it, and you're not getting anywhere. That idea of starting with a theory, um, I think a lot of people forget to do that. We get so carried away with jumping into the data and, and playing with it and forget that we need to have a purpose to always come back to. Um, for some reason when you were um, explaining that, Mike, I was thinking about a, a quote um, from Carl Sagan um, in his book Cosmos. Have you ever come across that book? I've uh, seen it uh, and I know the name. Uh, it's not one that I've actually read. So I'm going to, you're going to educate me now. So I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs> I love that book. Um, I, it's like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I reread it um, every few years because I, I just love it. But anyway, um, you're talking about science. And I love what Carl Sagan says about science. He says, if we lived on a planet where nothing ever changed, then there'd be little to do. There'd be nothing to figure out. There'd be no impetus for science. And if we lived in an unpredictable world where things changed in random or very complex ways, 
we would not be able to figure things out. Again, there would be no such thing as science. But we live in an in-between universe where things change, but according to patterns, rules, or as we call them, the laws of nature. And, well, therefore, we need science. And you, your, your description of that meta process um, when we use measurement for diagnosis is almost like the scientific process, I think. It is indeed. And in fact, Walter Schuhart, who created the very first control charts, used uh, the scientific method or a version of it to uh, start to create uh, the, the improvement cycle, the plan, do, study, act, or some people call it plan, do, check, act mm. cycle. So it's based in scientific thinking. That's brilliant. And Carl Sagan gives us a reason for why we need it. <laughs> I love it. Um, this idea that you had about, you know, the theory really has to come first before we uh, can do analysis, um, otherwise we get paralysed. This makes me think of big data, um, and big data is everywhere now. I mean, everyone's talking about it. But I, I can't help feeling a little bit sceptical. Um, and the reason I feel sceptical is because all of virtually all of the people that I work with in all kinds of sectors, different types of organizations and, and different countries around the world even, they all struggle with the basics of measurement, the basics of using data in decision making. So Mike, do you do you have some thoughts on this and, and kind of what we should make of big data? Uh, like you, Stacey, I'm a little bit skeptical. Uh, big data is the next big thing in the in our analyst world, uh, and people get all very excited about new, fancy, big things. But for me, it's back to that theory first and then analysis. Um, we sometimes talk about having too much choice, and we and uh, we talk about uh, letting a kid loose in a in a sweet shop. But actually, a very interesting. Similar example was when I first went to Hamleys in London. Now Hamleys is a a large department store, so it's a it's a large shop over four or five floors in central London that's totally dedicated to toys, nothing but toys. Fun. Now I didn't go in there until I was a lot older, so I was in my sort of probably early twenties. But even so, I was bowled over with the, the sheer choice. I can imagine going in there as a 10-year-old, being absolutely gobsmacked and, and just not knowing where to start. And to some degree, that's the problem with big data. There's so much there, you just don't know where to start. And you could spend weeks, months, years just wallowing in it. You won't get anywhere. So you've got to have your theory first, and then you use the data to test out your theory. Fabulous. That makes sense. I mean, I'm the you know the idea of big data to me it's it, it's a similar feeling I had when the word analytics started getting used a lot because it was always just analysis. We did statistical analysis or data analysis, and then suddenly it's called analytics. And there's been a few little shifts like that um, that that always ring alarm bells for me. And and I think what we if we extrapolate what you've just shared with us, it's that idea of always go back to purpose. What are we trying to do? Um, and and, and then how do we make use of modern tools and, and modern um, technology to, to be able to, to do it? Yes, that's right. Um, and sorry to butt in there. Um, I'll give you another one, and that's informatics, because certainly in the health service that became another buzz phrase probably about uh, 10 or 15 years ago now. Uh, and really it's just information and information departments, but informatics sounds so much more cool, doesn't it? It does. I think when you have a, the sound k in a word, it's a, a marketer's dream. There's something about that k sound that people like apparently. And like quants, you know, we used to call them um, data analysts, but now they're quants. Yeah, <laughs> I could, we could go on forever, but <laughs> let's move move to the next question I have for you, Mike. Um, this, is, this is about um, well, I'm curious about your ideas of how we would combine the work I do, the measurement of results, with uh, the work you do, um, the measurement, measurement for diagnosis and improvement. What are your ideas about the way we combine those two? So the way you would bring measurement for diagnosis into your world, I would suggest, is if you get a signal in your XMR chart, 
so that 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 signal is an invitation to go and investigate. You've got a reason now to investigate because there's a scientific statistical basis for saying this result we've got is not what we're expecting in this process. So just go and investigate. Um, signal, in a sense, is that problem or symptom that I talk about in my, my world. And so you use the same procedure and pretty much the, the same tools. Uh, I would just introduce another, um, not a tool necessarily, but a, a way in, and that's to ask the question, when is the problem occurring? So is it a particular time of day that we that we see this signal and perhaps that there's more than one of them or is it a particular day of the week or time of the year or is it the beginning of a shift or the end of a shift and so on. So that idea about when goes with where, um, where's the problem uh, and by looking at both when and where you will usually get to the root cause. Is there another question Mike? Who is the problem? A lot of leaders um, tend to default to that question, I think. It's usually the first one they, they kind of ask, either implicitly or explicitly. Yes, and we get that here too. Um, you're listening to uh, the news or watching on TV and there's a problem somewhere in some government department or, or, or perhaps in some uh, private industrial concern and there's always the implication that who's to blame, who are we going to sack. And actually Deming, um, who I know you 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 reference in your work, said mm. that, well towards the end of his life anyway, he said actually it's about 96% of the time the problem is with the process and only 4% by inference is it people. So why don't we go with the most likely uh, scenario, which is actually it's the problem that's generating the, sorry, it's the, it's the system, the process that's generating the problem, not the individual. And actually, if you think about it, we've got plenty of academic research, uh, published papers, people like um, Frederick Hertzberg and Douglas McGregor going way back to the 1960s that say, actually, people want to do a good job. They don't show up to work wanting to mess up. And so if they do, it's largely because the system they work in doesn't allow them to do a good job. Uh, and, 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 and that famous paper by Hertzberg in the Harvard Business Review, you can't get more um, august than that, <laughs> says you, you know, but you can't motivate people in that sense externally with extrinsic carrots and sticks. What really motivates people is inside them, the intrinsic motivation to want to, to achieve. And actually, if you just allow them to achieve, they will achieve. Uh, Dan Pink, Daniel Pink, he, he writes a lot about this as well, exactly what you're describing about that uh, intrinsic motivation um, in his book Drive, The surpri Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us. And that's a, that's a really big, um, a big message that he has in there that, you know, we, we, really, we really have to work on um, intrinsic motivation. Uh, he talks about, or he references, um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, it's D-E-C-I, is it Desi or Deki or something? Um, and he was a discoverer of something called the Sawyer effect nearly 40 years ago. So you're right, I mean, this stuff has been around for a long time, but for some reason in business we keep ignoring it. That would be one thing I'd love to see completely be abolished from the from the world is this, this assumption that people are the problem. You're right. We've got to go with what's most likely. And what was that percentage again? That what what percentage of the time is the problem in the process? So Deming started by saying 85% it was the process, and he ended up later in his life saying actually no, it's more like 96% of the time. So 96 out of 100 times the problem is going to be in the process, not with the people. Yeah. It's, it's, it, uh, it just it really baffles me why that's just not common knowledge. But uh, there's still hope, Mike. You and I will keep talking about it and, and people who agree with us will keep talking about it and maybe one day it will be that 
the way we use measurement and data is about improving processes and particularly using uh, the techniques that you've shared with us today about measurement for diagnosis, um, cause analysis and that um, meta process for how we, we go about doing it and how we blend it with our performance measurement or, or measurement of results. Mike, thank you so much for that. That was a really, um, really practical set of ideas that you've shared and I'll put links to a lot of that um, in the show notes if you um, if you have some that you'd like to forward to me. Yes, I've got a couple of links to the uh, the seven quality tools so I'll definitely do that uh, and um, if people want to uh, find me on the, the internet then I'm on Twitter but only very occasionally um, so that's at Mike Davidge and I'm also on LinkedIn, so people can find me there, and I'm happy to connect with people if they uh, want to. That's great, Mike. Thanks so much. Everybody, make sure you go and watch um, the video with Mike in it. You'll, you're, I mean, you've already heard what a great style he has and how well he explains things. Um, that video is just really impressive. I, I was... I, I go back and watch it every other time, every, uh, every once in a while, just like I, I go back and keep reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and Cosmos, so it's, it's really good. Mike, it's a pleasure always to have a chat with you. Thanks so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you very much, Stacey, and uh, hopefully this won't be the last. Of course not. <laughs>